Well, welcome to our discussion on COVID-19 and pediatric populations. I'm Dr. Joe Fresca. I'm the head of Phillips Research for the Americas and Chief Medical Officer for Phillips in North America. I'm a pediatric intensivist, and I'm on the faculty of the Institute for Medicine, Engineering, and Science at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Joining me today is Dr. Ira Chaifetz. Dr. Chaifetz is an internationally recognized pediatric intensivist with expertise in mechanical ventilation and pediatric acute respiratory distress syndrome. He's authored nearly 200 peer-reviewed publications and textbook chapters, and is often presented at national and inter international symposia. In our discussion today, we'll focus on the incidence, symptoms, treatment options, and prevention of COVID-19 in pediatric populations. Welcome, Dr. Chaifetz. Thank you, John. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. To get us started, could you share your insights on the prevalence of pediatric infection with COVID-19 and how symptoms present specifically for children? Yeah, so much of the attention of COVID-19 has really been on the adult population, but I'm glad we have a session, this opportunity today to talk about the pediatric aspects. Luckily, the vast majority of infants, children, adolescents with COVID-19 have asymptomatic or mild disease. For those who are symptomatic, presentations are largely similar to, to adults, with fever occurring somewhere between 40 to 80 percent of um, children with COVID-19, depending on the population studied, as well as symptoms of uh, respiratory disease, including cough and tachypnea. Luckily, in children, severe respiratory distress is much less likely to occur than in adults, although GI symptoms may be somewhat more likely as a present, presenting a set of symptoms. The uh, incidence is, again, luck of severe disease is luckily low. In the populations reported so far out of China, Italy, and now the United States, specifically New York City, uh, the incidence of those uh, children with COVID-19 who develop severe symptoms is about 5%. And that number might actually be falsely high by the denominator effect because presumably many more children have COVID-19 than have been studied and included in, in the populations uh, reported. Sure, and that's that's true for adult, both adult and pediatric populations, I'm sure. Um, well, with, with your expertise in mechanical ventilation and pediatric acute respiratory distress syndrome, could you elaborate a little bit on current best practices regarding respiratory management of the pediatric COVID-19 patient? Of course, yes. So as I mentioned, about 5% of the population studied of children have severe disease, and severe disease is defined as a presence of hypoxia. The uh, incidence of critical disease uh, requiring respiratory support and, and ventilation is about 0.5%, so very small numbers, again, uh, much different than the adult population. In terms of management approaches, we're still learning. We're very much learning here. Uh, right now, the first line therapies for those uh, infants and children's requ children requiring uh, respiratory support beyond basic uh, low flow routine oxygen has been the use of high flow nasal cannula and NIV uh, as an additional modality. Uh, that's quite different than early in the pandemic where there was this hesitancy to use uh, high flow nasal cannula and NIV for fear of aerosolization of virus and exposure of staff. But now that PPE and specifically N95 masks are more available, uh, the initial approach, and I believe it's a reasonable approach, is to try uh, high flow nasal cannula NIV. For those uh, children who develop more significant uh, respiratory disease and require intubation, and mechanical ventilation, we do not yet have uh, COVID specific management guidelines and the general recommendations. And my suggestion would be to follow uh, what's been published by the Pediatric Acute Lung Injury Consensus Conference, known as PALIC, was published back in June of 2015. Uh, the, the recommendations are for those pediatric patients with ARDS to use tidal volumes of 5 to 8 ml per kilo for those uh, patients with more preserved respiratory system compliance, and lower tidal volumes as low as 3 to 6 ml per kilo for children with PARDS and more severe compromise of their respiratory system compliance. To limit peak pressures to 28 centimeters of water or less, uh, 
titrate FiO2 uh, for permissive hypoxemia, specifically saturations of 88 to 92 percent for those with more severe disease. And the last question that is often discussed or raised is that of PEEP. Uh, PEEP management in COVID-19 uh, is controversial and, and has been debated already. Uh, my recommendation in, in the general approach is to individualize PEEP management uh, by using a specific PEEP uh, titration grid uh, titration approach for each individual patient. That's great. And I, and I think uh, your um, emphasis on individualizing the approach is, is going to be important for this disease where we often see preserved compliance uh, in, in, the, uh, in the face of uh, severe hypoxia. So right. I and think that goes, uh, you've, go oh, sorry. <laughs> you've outlined uh, sorry. that approach. Go ahead. Yeah, um, no, the awkwardness of, of tele-interviews. Tele um, that also, I think, supports the uh, use of high nasal cannula as an initial modality where many of these patients need some respiratory support, but really oxygen therapy uh, because their baseline a respiratory system compliance is generally preserved, uh, except in the most critical uh, of these children. Great, thank you. I wanna turn now to uh, MIS-C or multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children. Um, we know that the CDC's uh, started to receive reports of a multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children associated with COVID-19. Can you tell us about the presentation and the management and outcome so far of this uh, new syndrome? Yes, you know, early in the pandemic, it was largely viewed that children would be spared, um, but that's not what we're seeing now. Uh, obviously, the numbers in children of acute and, and, and uh, post-infectious uh, syndrome in MISC are much smaller than adults, but we are seeing critically ill children now presenting with this inflammatory syndrome. It's a Kawasaki's-like syndrome in the sense that it is a post-viral inflammatory state uh, the vast majority, I think the latest report was just over 90% of uh, children with MISC have uh, documented COVID-19 infection either by PCR or antibodies. Uh, the definition of MISC is a child less than 21 years of age who presents with fever, uh, laboratory markers of an inflammatory state, as well as one or more organ systems that are dysfunctional and or failing. The uh, syndrome itself is just that, it's a syndrome, it's a compilation of, of findings. Uh, treatment has been largely um, uh, based on or mimicked that that's been used for Kawasaki's disease, specifically IVIG and corticosteroids. Luckily, most of these children have done quite well, although some children have gone on to severe critical illness, and in some cases, unfortunately, um, have died. The um, general uh, difference, one of the key differences that we're seeing with MISC compared to Kawasaki's disease is these children who do present with significant critical illness are presenting with more cardiac failure, and some of these patients have actually required ECMO support. Great. So the next question, sort of to follow up on that, is going to be more difficult to answer, I think. Um, we know that these uh, patients with MISC can uh, present with a Kawasaki like disease. Um, do you have any insights on the differences between the current uh, new inflammatory syndrome we're seeing and Kawasaki disease? Uh, I wish I could I wish I could give a specific answer. Kawasaki's disease has been studied since its uh, re first report back in the late 1960s. Kawasaki's disease has always been felt, or felt by many, I should say, to be a post-infectious inflammatory state. And that is what we're seeing here with MISC. Um, in this case, it, it almost convincingly is a post-viral inflammatory state. But there are some key differences between the two, one of which is, is key is age. Kawasaki's disease generally presents in children less than five years of age, and often in children one to two years of age. MISC has been seen in children of all ages, including adolescents and even older adolescents. So a key difference there. And as I mentioned before, we are seeing a little bit more um, cardiac failure in MISC than Kawasaki's disease. But of note, both of these uh, syndromes, these disease states 
uh, in the critically ill, we are seeing um, coronary artery aneurysms. So there are similarities, there are some differences, and a lot more research uh, needs to occur. There are currently two, at least two, ongoing prospective observational studies, one out of the UK, one out of the United States, trying to better define this entity and better characterize it. So more to learn about uh, this new entity. Um, and uh, so we'll have, to, uh, we'll have to talk again about that. Yeah. Um, thank you very much for your uh, clinical insights uh, into the management of uh, pediatric patients with COVID-19. Ira, now, as many societies and governments are developing plans to reopen, um, healthcare providers are encouraging uh, families to bring their kids back to the, the office for vaccinations and other potentially deferred uh, interventions. How do you address parents who are frightened to bring uh, kids in for routine care uh, in, in the midst of this pandemic? Right. Well, early in the pandemic, I think the natural response of parents of most people uh, were to avoid the healthcare setting unless one was truly very ill or had COVID-19 for fear of getting the viral, the coronavirus infection um, from the healthcare setting. Uh, that, that belief, that approach, that thoughts was probably reasonable at the time, especially since the general mindset was that we would be through this wave in, in a short amount of time, weeks to maybe a month or two. But now that we're several months in with no end in sight, uh, it's clear that COVID infection is here to stay with us for quite some time. We really need to be sure that we're focusing on routine care and preventive care for all, uh, all people, for everyone, all populations, all ages, but especially our children who truly need vaccination and preventive care. Um, at this point, with the um, safety nets that are put in place by healthcare settings uh, to prevent spread of COVID infection in the clinic setting, in the hospital setting, I think the risks are quite low. And one could argue that actually the risks are lower than in the community, especially in many communities around the US and beyond where um, coronavirus infection is spreading quite, quite rapidly. So I think it's safe um, and we really need to be sure that we return to the focus of basic uh, care and basic preventive care. Right, and perhaps the, the risk of, uh, of, of infection with common childhood diseases that we can immunize against is higher than uh, heading back into the environment of the healthcare setting um, where the risk is so low for COVID-19. Absolutely, in recent years, we've seen multiple measles outbreaks, and if we're not vaccinating our children, those are gonna occur at a much higher rate. Right, I agree. Well, Ira, thank you again for your uh, discussion and insights here on COVID-19 and children. Could I ask if you have any uh, additional uh, ideas and thoughts on preventive measures and final takeaways for the audience? Yeah, we can talk for quite a bit of time about the presentation of COVID disease and the management of severe COVID disease in children. But the most important is preventing it and preventing the spread. The prevention in children are the same as adults. Uh, social distancing as possible, acknowledging that it's sometimes harder to keep children at a distance than, than adults. But having said that, really the keys are gonna be good hand hygiene, um, hand washing, um, hand, alcohol, um, you know, the different alcohol products out there for hand hygiene, keep the hands clean, clean the hands often, and masks. Uh, if children are within six feet of each other and they're going to be, uh, wear masks. Early there was this a view that children wouldn't wear masks and shouldn't wear masks. But the American Academy of Pediatrics, their recommendations make sense uh, that children who are two years of age and older, unless for specific situations, uh, an individual child might be at risk, of suffocation or strangulation from a mask. Children should wear masks ages two and older. And children are wearing masks in the community. You can go to stores, anywhere in the community and, and watch young children wearing masks and they're fine with it. Uh, adults are wearing masks, they're wearing masks. Let them choose the mask that they like, just like they choose a shirt to wear for the day. And it should become routine management, routine, not routine management, routine everyday life um, until we can get through this pandemic. Great, well, thank you for those insights. Uh, it's been great talking to you and thank you for joining us for talking and talking about this uh, very important subject, one that touches everyone's lives these days around the globe. Thank you again.
for your uh, time. And thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure.